everyone. Um, thank you for joining this exciting session. Um, we are so happy to have um, a couple of stellar representatives from the Office of the Historian, which is nestled in the State Department. Um, we have Miss Kathleen Rasmussen and also Sarah uh, Berndt. Sorry, I messed that up again, didn't I? Um, excuse me. Uh, here with us today to talk about the work of the office and, and share a little bit about some of the projects that they have done and give you an overview. Um, you may know that this is the start of a series um, and we hope that we can get folks energized and interested in kind of a new uh, area of the State Department that we aren't so familiar with here at WCAPS. As you know, WCAPS, our mission is to advance the careers and the work and the voices of women of color in the peace and security space. And part of that work is exposing them to new areas that they may not know about, new careers, um, new interesting, you know, intersections, et cetera. So we're very delighted to have you here and, and learning with us. Um, I can do brief introductions, but those are always a little, you know, stuffy. I would love the opportunity for you two to introduce yourselves and leap right into the presentation. Um, I will start with Sarah. She is a historian at the U.S. State Department Office of the Historian. And since 2010, she has provided research and other historical support to policymakers and compiled and edited documents on U.S. Latin American relations for inclusion in the 150 year old Foreign Relations of the United States series. Very exciting stuff. Her foreign relations volume on the U.S. policy in South America during the Jimmy Carter administration was published in 2018. So that's something you might wanna look up and look into. Um, portions of that volume were used as a basis for the Argentina Declassification Project, which if I'm not mistaken, you guys will touch on today. Yep, um, definitely. Yeah, which released over 40,000, yes, 40,000 US government documents on human rights to the government of Argentina. She earned her PhD in Latin American history from the George Washington University in 2011 and her BA in art with honors from the University of Chicago in 2000. Uh, I'm sorry, in history. I don't know why I saw art. Um, I got a promotion just there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe I was reading art history. Uh, anyway. Awesome. So welcome. Thank um, you. Next, I would like to introduce Kathleen, who has served as a general editor of the Foreign Relations of the United States series, uh, the official documentary history of U.S. foreign relations since 2019. Since she joined the Office of the Historian in 2002, becoming chief of the Global Issues and General Division in 2009, she has researched and compiled three FRUS volumes, so that's the acronym for, for that uh, document. Um, she's compiled three volumes focusing on U.S. foreign economic policy and U.S. relations with Western Europe during the 1970s. Her current volume documents U.S. international trade and monetary policies during Ronald Reagan's second administration. So now as division chief and general editor, um, she has reviewed more than 25 volumes and compilations on topics such as U.S. relations with Europe, the Americas, and Asia. Um, transnational issues such as arms control and counterterrorism, which are terms that we know well here at WCAPS, um, and themes such as national security policy, the organization and management of U.S. foreign policymaking, and the intellectual foundations of U.S. foreign policy. Uh, she holds an MA in International Relations from the John Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies um, and a PhD in History from the University of Toronto. Uh, I will leave it at that and, and hand it over to, to you two. And thank you so much for being here and sharing with us and 
look forward to your presentation. So I'll kick things off for me and Sarah. You have no reason to thank us at all because we want to thank you for taking, for having us here. Sarah and I are both really, really excited about this opportunity. Um, I particularly like to thank um, Dr. Glover and Ms. Gay for inviting us to come here today to um, to to share with you the some information about the work of our office as well as our parent bureau, and also for setting up this presentation and not least for um, allowing me to preview some of the tech features of the presentation and make sure that I uh, hopefully didn't make too many mistakes once we get going. Um, I have to say that, um, again, I'll speak on behalf of Sarah as well. I think I can do this. Um, I want to say it's really an honor to appear before this group. Um, the work that you've done since 2017 to expand the national security conversation in terms of both its leadership and really its very definition of what we really mean by national security. Um, you know, your work in establishing chapters across four continents, more than a dozen working groups, bringing together students, early career professionals and senior leaders inside and outside the government, your mentoring and fellowship programs, publications, podcasts, speaker series, and initiatives such as the unbelievably super cool art and policy forum and the really sort of helpful nitty gritty step-by-step uh, -step media gatekeepers toolkit it's really inspiring. So um, as I say, Sarah and I have really been looking forward to this talk and uh, we're just delighted to be able to, to, to be able to hear, to be with you today. Um, so before I start talking about our office, um, let me situate it within its larger organizational context, because of course we're from the Department of State and so therefore we have to talk about organization and, and sort of the institution. Um, uh, the Office of the Historian is, uh, is, a, is a school within the Foreign Service Institute. Uh, the Foreign Service Institute was founded in 1946, and it's the U.S. government's premier foreign affairs training provider dedicated to ensuring the career-long learning opportunities required for success in today's global arena. It's proud to serve the department and also U.S. government foreign agencies community as a strategic enabler of diplomatic excellence from its beautiful campus in Arlington, Virginia, um, known as the George P. Schultz, uh, George P. Schultz National Foreign Affairs Training Center. FSI prepares the foreign affairs community to do its best across the spectrum of training and tradecraft with more than 70 languages, area studies, leadership courses, management courses, applied information technology, and personal, familial, and cross-cultural adaptation. Now, the 21st century, of course, has brought unprecedented global change, and FSI has adapted its training to prepare the workforce to meet today's challenges. In particular, um, FSI has really gotten on board with um, sort of a hybrid approach to learning. Um, clearly, this really sort of came to fruit during the pandemic when um, FSI like just pivoted like that, actually, to almost overnight to doing all of its classes in person, to doing all of its classes online. And, you know, as, as, as the pandemic has continued and changed, um, the Foreign Service Institute really has has um, uh, tried to try to find ways where it can sort of do the learning in person that works best in person and do learning that works best online. And, you know, the latter, of course, works perfectly well for foreign affairs officials sort of scattered, um, you know, throughout embassies and consulates all over the world. Um, FSI has, um, it also, it also uh, bases its work on the latest advancement, advancements in cognitive research, the work of innovative thought leaders from around the world to challenge uh, its students to explore new individual strengths, broaden organizational capacities, and strive for better outcomes for our country and for the world. Now, FSI has four schools, the School of Language Studies, the School of Professional and Area Studies, School of Applied Information Technology, and the Leadership Management School. It also has one center known as the Transition Center, which is really actually kind of cool. Their, their job is they focus on preparing, um, uh, preparing State Department officials for overseas, overseas assignments and sort of navigating the foreign affairs lifestyle, building personal, family, and community resilience, and also retirement planning and career transition for members of the foreign and civil, uh, foreign service particularly, I think is what their focus is. And of course, um, us, <laughs> we're, we're, also, we're also a part <laughs> of the Foreign Service Institute. Um, FSI, most of the students at FSI come from the State Department, and they include all categories of State Department staff. So that's your Foreign Service officers, you know, the traditional diplomats, um, the civil service 
non-career um, uh, department employees, as well as locally employed staff. So the thousands of people who work at U.S. embassies and consulates um, and missions all across the world, um, who are foreign nationals, um, uh, nations of their of their host countries, and 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 uh, you know work hand in hand with with um, Department of State. Um, uh, foreign service officers. FSI also provides foreign affairs training for more than 50 other U.S. government agencies. Um, uh, in fact, FSI trains about, uh, wow, 82,800 employees annually from over 100 U.S. government agencies, ranging from the Departments of Defense and Agriculture and Energy to, to, to many more. Now, um, FSI is actually a relatively new home for the office. Um, prior to 2019, we actually were a part of uh, the Bureau of Public Affairs. But then in 2019, that bureau underwent um, uh, a very a massive reorganization, basically, and we joined FSI in that year. It's proved to be a really great fit for us because of sort of the academic bent. We're an office, you know, like staffed with with a lot of uh, a lot of folks with academic bents, basically, having spent a lot of time in grad school. Um, so it's a really great fit for us. Um, and as suggested by my remarks, the Office of the Historian is staffed by more than 40 professionally trained scholars um, with graduate degrees primarily in history, as well as um, area studies and also related fields. Um, we have a variety of missions. Some are primarily public facing. Others are more sort of focused on um, sort of the, the, the policy process within the department and across the, inter the foreign affairs interagency. And so to divvy up, divvy up how we talk about those missions, I'm going to start by talking about our primary public facing mission. This is the production of the Foreign Relations of the United States series, after which I'm going to throw it over to Sarah, who's going to talk about um, uh, actually another really cool public facing um, initiative that our office uh, played a big role in, that Sarah played a big role in, um, as well as the internal missions that, that, our, office, that our office does. So the Foreign Relations of the United States series, or FRUS, um, is the official documentary history of U.S. foreign relations. Um, what differentiates FRUS from traditional works of history? Um, you know, most historians, we go into the archives, we rifle through papers that are like super old. This is, um, you know, this is, we, we look for primary documents speaking to whatever topic we're, we're, we're discussing. Um, traditional histories, of course, you know, you take those documents, you go, you get in your pajamas, you sit at your laptop, and you write out your book, right? You write a narrative. Here at the office, what we do is instead of um, writing a narrative and instead of sort of laying our own interpretations on those documents, we actually publish the documents themselves. So the example I always use is instead of me telling you what Henry Kissinger told Richard Nixon in 1973 about whatever, um, uh, we'll actually print the memorandum that uh, Kissinger sent to Nixon or the memorandum of conversation, the minutes of the talk they had, we'll actually print those documents. Um, uh, in, 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 in these volumes, these first volumes that include um, annotation that tells you where the document's from, um, gives you sort of context about the document, background, other sources you might want to consult, sort of a full sort of scholarly apparatus um, associated with each document. Now, the department has been publishing through since 1861, making it the oldest publication of this kind in the world. Um, we've got more than 550 volumes in the series, all of which are freely available and completely word and uh, uh, completely searchable on our website, history.state.gov, which we'll take a little tour of in, uh, later on. Um, we, you know, Fruce, we think Fruce is important because it office obviously offers sort of insights into contemporary um, uh, policy challenges. They serve as an important repository of critical documents for journalists, scholars, and students. Um, they provide the citizens of the United States, as well as actually other nations around the world, an important source for an understanding of their own history. And also, and I think, and you'll hear me talk about this a little bit later, I think, um, perhaps most important, Fruis ref reflects the U.S. government's commitment to transparency in policymaking. In 1991, Congress passed a law codifying, codifying um, Fruis's production, mandating that it be, quote, a thorough, accurate, and reliable documentary record of major U.S. foreign policy decisions and significant United States diplomatic activity, published no later than 30 years after the events that are documented. 
Producing each fruits volume um, is actually a very complex multi-stage process that takes place over several years. It involves at least a half a dozen historians in our office, aided by archivists, interagency records managers and declassification review officers, proofreaders and typesetters outside of our office, making fruits really the product of a sort of a coordinated group effort. Um, it's um, in, in that way, it's, it's, it's very sort of collaborative process that's also sort of unlike sort of how oftentimes traditional her, uh, histories are, are created. Each volume begins when one of our offices compiling historians conducting about a year's worth of research in classified and declassified historical interagency foreign policy records relevant to their topic. And after that, they take about another year to organize those thousands of documents that they've collected in their research, um, still mostly paper-based. Uh, we do have some digital research, but still the archives that we work with are mostly paper-based. Um, organizing it and then selecting the, I don't know, 350 most representative, most critical documents to understanding their particular topic, as well as annotating them, again, providing them with footnotes, um, telling the reader more about the documents, situ situating them in context, giving you further resources. Um, once that's finished, it goes through, uh, the volume goes through two stage review process to make sure that it conforms to our very specific, very finicky sort of first style and represents a thorough, accurate, a thorough and accurate um, uh, account of its subject matter. Now, after the com after the compiling historian has review has revised that volume in keeping with those reviews, the volume goes to a an, uh, declassification coordinator within the office, um, because all volumes inevitably include uh, like a hefty amount of uh, classified information. They have to be declassified before they can sent be sent out before they can be published. And so we have uh, in office declassification coordinators who read through the manuscript, figure out which agencies have an equity. Um, in each of the documents, i.e. Um, have some sort of stake because they drafted it, because they attended a meeting, um, because they were a recipient. These, these, all these many documents that we've chosen get farmed out to the various agencies. Obviously, the Department of State is one. Um, the CIA is another one. The National Security Council, the Department of Defense. Depends on your topic. Um, but those are some of our, our major interagency partners. There, there are uh, reviewers who review um, the classified uh, documents to see what can be released without damaging national security. Um, we also have an, a team of in-house editors who uh, work on this draft manuscript, both when it's being declassified and then um, they finalize their, their technical editing and proofreading um, uh, once the volume has been completely declassified. Um, that takes an extended period of time. So there are a lot of eyes on each first volume. Um, and it, it, takes, it takes a long time to make sure that sort of all all the I's are dotted and all the T's are crossed. But but happily, once um, you know once that blessed day comes, the volumes uh, we publish our volumes um, on our website history.state.gov, ooh, which Sarah has already helpfully shared in the chat. And I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to share my screen so I can show you a little bit about our website. Share. Ah, there we go. Um, so once once a first volume has been researched, compiled, declassified, and completely edited, it's published here on our own dedicated website. Again, history.state.gov. If you go to the historical documents section, you'll see in foreign relations of the United States. This is where you can see um, uh, uh, the the whole little tiny thumbnail pictures of of all of the presidents. Um, for which we currently have um, volumes either published or volumes underway. So, for example, you'll see that we stop with Clinton um, because we have, frankly, we have not yet we have not yet um, uh, sort of gone through the process of deciding what volumes we should we should prepare for George W. Bush and onwards into the future. So, we're stopping with Clinton. Um, I, we've, we, we currently have volumes in various stages of production um, spanning from the Nixon administration through the Clinton administration. Um, but right now we're basically publishing volumes um, that document the foreign policy of uh, the Carter administration as well as the Reagan administration. And now given WCAPS's focus on national security issues, I thought I'd just highlight a handful of volumes that I thought might be of interest um, uh, to this audience. So clicking over onto Ronald Reagan, 
I will start with, we just recently published a volume on the strategic arms reduction talks or strategic arms reduction treaty that was negotiated. Um, uh, negotiations began in the early 1980s and they were concluded um, in 1991 when George H. W. Bush um, uh, and um, uh, when when the, the when Washington and Moscow signed the treaty. Um, this volume that I'm showing right here covers the just covers the the Reagan administration. A subsequent volume, which will take the volume through to its uh, take the treaty through to its um, signature in 1991. That's currently in declassification. Hopefully, that will come out soon. You can see 330. What is this? 337 documents we have. Um, you know, this one. This this compiler decided to arrange them chronologically. Um, we don't print the documents themselves. We print trans, uh, uh, typeset versions of the documents. Um, you'll see that there are there are footnotes associated with each document. The first footnote always tells you where um, always tells you where the 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 um, the the document was found in the archives. Tells you what its original classification was, and then tells you some more information about the document. Um, the second footnote is a great um, example of uh, sort of a contextual uh, type footnote that we would include that refers to, tells you more about an NSC meeting and also tells you where you can find the record of that NSC meeting um, elsewhere in the foreign relations series. Of course, it's cross reference You can just click over and there you go. So another volume from Reagan that I thought might be of some interest. Um, uh, it's, it's one of, it's, it's a really nifty volume. We also, um, it's, a, it's, it's called Global Issues, which is a rather anodyne name, but um, it includes a series of sort of transnational issues. Um, of course, you know, transnational, international issues have always been around, but, but, you know, starting in the seventies, of course, as we know that you see a lot more emphasis on, on, on sort of transnational issues. Uh, Alex Poster, we published this one in 2017. Um, I think it's it's great. It has a beautiful, like not beautiful, a horrific and depressing chapter, but very well documented chapter on U.S. policy towards um, HIV slash AIDS epidemic that took place during the, that that you know that that really sort of became prominent in the 1980s. Smaller chapter has a chapter on human rights. The ever popular law of the sea, um, which is a surprisingly interesting um, issue. The African famine, again, um, uh, a big a big issue for policymakers in the 1980s, population, whaling, and protection of the ozone layer. So, you know, a mix of sort of environmental things, um, uh, environmental issues, health issues, population issues. So that's Reagan. Um, just a couple on Carter, I just wanted to highlight. We also have... Um, Similarly, on Carter, we have a volume that is dedicated to human rights and humanitarian affairs, has many of the same themes as the volume I just showed you. This was put together by um, Kristen Alberg. Um, uh, we, you know, we decided to give a lot of uh, emphasis on human rights during the Carter administration because, of course, that was one of sort of the hallmarks of his foreign policy. And one of the, the big um, promises that he made on the campaign trail was that he was going to you know, sort of like make human rights a, a priority in his foreign policy. And so we have a substantial portion, two thirds of the volume basically is on human rights, but also we do have um, hunger and food policy as well as health, population growth and women's issues. Finally, thinking about um, sort of conflict transformation and peace, um, I was thinking that I might highlight, we actually have two uh, volumes dedicated to one of Carter's signature foreign policy achievements, which of course is the Camp David Accords. And so we've got two, um, oh, this is, this must be the old one. Um, we have a uh, second revised edition <laughs> of, um, of uh, part two of the Camp David Accords. This is volume nine, as you can see. And our compiler, Alex Whelan, sort of like split it up by chapters um, to give you a sense of like sort of how, to, how it's organized. But we also have the pre-discussions back here, sorry, back in volume eight, which um, is just organizes straight in straight chronological order, gives you a sense of sort of the groundwork that the Carter administration had to had to lay in order to get the negotiations underway. And um, just, I know that Sarah later on is going to talk to us about um, the, uh, Sarah later on is going to talk to us, of course, about her volume with American Republics. And I'm looking for it. And it's 28, Kathy. Thank you. There it is. <laughs> So as we see, our very own Sarah Berndt and her um, South America, Latin American region 
uh, uh, volume. Um, in particular, she's going to be talking about Argentina, and that will that will come in a little bit. Um, let me just say parenthetically that um, uh, we have a number of historical resources beyond Fruce. Um, I just want to, um, on our website, I'll just say um, the department history has sort of an overview of the department's institutional history, biographies of secretaries, to, um, exhaustive lists of um, principal officers and chiefs of mission um, going back to the founding, basically, so you can find out who served where when. Um, Secretary of State travels, presidential travels, visits by foreign heads of state, um, some interpretive essays. The administrative timeline, I think, is really interesting. This is a relatively new um, innovation where we've just sort of tried to keep up with sort of the institutional changes within the department. Um, so I found, for example, I was I was happy when I clicked on this earlier today, I was happy to see that on January 28th, 2020, Working Parents at State, an employee-driven peer group that meant monthly for parents to find support and resources, cultivate community, and advocate for the needs of working parents at the department held its inaugural meeting at the Harry S. Truman Building. So um, that's a really sort of fun, that's a fun, it's a, it's, it's, it's a great resource. Finally, the guide to countries. Um, we have a guide to country recognition and relations um, that give you a sense of when it is that we recognized each country. Um, here's the one on Argentina. Uh, again, sort of hooking up with Sarah's, um, Sarah's uh, talk later today. Let me just, um, a few more, just, just, I will, I will just have a few more things to say. Um, the website, we're, we're particularly proud of the fact that our website receives visits from all over the world, um, as I suggested in my remarks earlier. Um, in fact, from March 1st, 2022 through February 28th, 2023, 58% of the of our website's more than 10 million users were domestic, while 42% actually visited us from abroad. Sorry, my light has gone out. It's still out. 42% um, visit us from abroad, and the top 10 foreign visitors by country were in descending order. Um, India was the, we had the most hits from India, the United Kingdom, Canada, the Philippines, Australia, Pakistan, Nigeria, Germany, South Africa, Singapore, and New Zealand. Um, we're really proud of the fact, as I suggested before, that a lot of folks in other countries get, you know, learn about their own history often through our series. Um, and I, you know, speaking of pride, I just I'll, I'll I'll close I'll close these remarks finally um, by noting that, um, in my opinion, sort of one of the most important functions of this series, the foreign relations series, both at home and abroad, is that it really stands for again sort of a symbol and a reflection of the U.S. government's commitment to openness, transparency, and accountability. You know, as the official documentary history of U.S. foreign relations, when a document's published in Fruce, it is the equivalent of the U.S. government saying, you know, we did this. Um, whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether it's ambivalent, whether it's ugly, whether it's laudable, whatever it is, when it goes in fruce, it's the U.S. government actually owning up to what it did, you know, several decades ago. It's not yesterday, but still, like a number of decades ago. And I th and I think that I think that matters. And um, I'll just close by saying that 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 sort of that's that's sort of that 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 thought, this responsibility that we have um, to sort of make sure that, that the U.S. government does hold itself accountable. It actually is in the minds of everybody who works on this series. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah, um, and she could tell us about our office's more internally facing um, uh, missions, as well as an aw awesome interagency declassification diplomacy project in which she played an important role, and uh, which we think will be of particular interest to this group. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I wanted to say again, thank you to WCAPS for inviting us. Uh, as Kathy said, we're really thrilled to be here today. And we also, I'm hoping to leave quite a bit of time for questions. So please feel free to ask questions either in the chat or uh, when I finally stop talking. <laughs> We'd love to hear your thoughts, your questions, um, your impressions. Um, so my job right now uh, is mostly focused on that internal support to the Department of State that Kathy talked about, whereas Fruis is mostly focused uh, toward the public. Um, Kathy, can you load? Oh, you have the slides up. Thank you very much. So um, we call our internally focused people the Historical Studies Divisions. And so what we do is we answer questions from policymakers about history. Um, we do a lot of research on sort of difficult historical questions. Um, we spend a lot of time in various types of archives trying to find the answers to their questions. Um, 
And what we're trying to do is help our department calls, colleagues understand the past, understand what happened in past negotiations, past US policies. Um, but we also often field questions about how history impacts foreign policy challenges today. So we've answered questions about, you know, why does why do our interlocutors in country X think this? <laughs> we try to get at why um, sort of how those past past th things that happened in the past affect today. Um, other people in our office also specialize in sort of the history of the Department of State as an institution. Um, they coordinate the education work that we do through the Foreign Service Institute. They manage those collections of data sets on the travels of the president and the principal officers that Kathy showed you on our website. Um, and most importantly, perhaps, um, they answer questions from the public and from our colleagues through a single email box that you can email anytime. Um, uh, we call that our mailbox, history at state.gov. Anybody can email us and we hope to respond fairly quickly to all types of historical questions. <clears throat> so um, as Gabby mentioned, my PhD is in Latin American history. Um, my dissertation focused on the relationship between the US and Cuba. And during my time in the office, I've worked on both FRUS and in the historical studies divisions. So my first assignment in the office was to research that first volume on Jimmy Carter's policy towards South America. So that was published in 2018. Um, and it documents US policy towards 10 countries in South America, and also includes a chapter covering um, the broad US policy toward the entire region of Latin America. So that includes um, there's other volumes on Carter's policy toward Central America um, and toward uh, Mexico, Cuba, and the Caribbean. So my volume includes sort of a broad regional chapter that touches on those parts of the Western Hemisphere as well. Um, so I was almost done uh, with the researching and editing and footnotes and all the stuff of that volume. This was back way back in 2016, eons ago. <laughs> um, and coincidentally, President Barack Obama scheduled a visit to Argentina in 2016. And that uh, visit happened to fall on the 40th anniversary of the coup in Argentina, which happened on March 24th of 1976. That anniversary was just last week. Um, and it's always marked in Argentina by sort of solemn recognition, marches, um, sort of, vigils uh, focused on the people who were killed or disappeared during the ensuing military dictatorship. And in 2016, Argentine human rights groups, when Obama's visit was announced, really criticized him for distracting from the memory of that day. They thought it was disrespectful and they threatened protests during his visit. And that's not something that the White House ever wants to hear when it announces a presidential visit. Um, so in response, uh, the president announced the beginning of a large multi-agency declassification project, the goal of which was to release U.S. government documents about human rights abuses in Argentina between the years of 1975, so right before the coup, uh, up till 1984 when Argentina returned to democracy. Uh, so that was in 2016, and over the next three years, through multiple releases during the presidencies of both Obama and Donald Trump, the project released 48,000 pages of US government documents to the government of Argentina and via a website that I will attempt to put in the chat as well to the, the whole global public. I don't know why I can't copy this. Uh, we'll do it in a second. <laughs> um, so I was really proud to be asked to work on that project. Um, for brevity's sake, I'm going to call it the ADP. Um, I mostly helped with sort of the massive research undertaking um, a little bit with sort of, it was a White House and um, Director of National Intelligence led project. Um, and, but because I had just done the research for this first volume, I was sort of one of the very few people in the government familiar with a lot of different archives where US government uh, records lived. Um, from that era about Argentina. And so I got to help with all kinds of really interesting questions about, we're looking for records about this, where would they be? <laughs> uh, so that's kind of a historian's dream. Um, so one thing that's interesting 
I think an interesting difference between the free series and this declassification project is that the free series focuses on really um, a sort of public goal and high level records. And this focus, this project focused on bilateral relations between the US and Argentina trying to improve those at the time and sort of every record about human rights that they could find. So it's not limited to only you know, records that the president saw, it released a lot of everything, which is something I'm gonna to try to show a little bit later. So once the president, once Obama's administration had promised this, um, the government of Argentina and human rights groups in both the US and Argentina consistently pressed for its completion. So they didn't let the White House forget that it <laughs> promised this. Um, and I think that speaks in a really interesting way to how important those goals of historical transparency and accountability that Kathy mentioned, how important those goals are to the global public. Um, and in many ways, I love WCAPS's inclusion of the phrase conflict transformation. I just love that phrase. And I don't think that that goal is possible without uh, historical transparency and accountability, especially after a historical trauma such as that experienced in Argentina. Um, so to date, the ADP is the largest delivery of US government documents to a foreign government in history. It's been hailed by journalists, scholars, and human rights groups as a new gold standard for how the US government can support another country's rule of law and process of healing after a historical trauma. So you can, you or anyone can see all the records released under this project at that link I dropped in the chat. I also wanted to mention that um, <clears throat> Almost all the records, because they're US government records, are in English. And that website is in English. But there's uh, an Argentine coalition of NGOs that's working to catalog all of those released US government records and make them more accessible to researchers, so especially those who speak Spanish. So this second website that I dropped there is the website from that coalition of Argentine NGOs. <clears throat> Um, so this project released records from 16 different US military intelligence, law enforcement and foreign affairs agencies and did it with very few redactions. Um, they're not Argentine records, there's none of those in there and they're not sort of private records, they're only documentation from the US government. And the goal of the project really in line with President Obama's stated goals at the beginning was to encourage US government agencies to make a very broad search for every relevant document that they could find about human rights in Argentina between 75 and 84. And after they had found all of them to make them, uh, to release them in a transparent, as an, in as a transparent way as they could. So the goal was really openness in, in a really dramatic way. Um, so I thought I would show you um, in the slides a few of the kinds of documents that were released as part of this project. So some of them are those very high level records like Fruce publishes. Those were seen by only a few government officials, um, but the ADP also released a lot of really raw, low level sort of unverified records. And both those types of records I think are valuable for different reasons. So that first, this first one is an example of the highest level intelligence document that presidents of the United States receive. It's called the President's Daily Brief or PDB. Uh, very few other officials are shown this when it's produced. It's produced every day. This one um, that Kathy is helpfully showing you here uh, is, was given to President Gerald Ford on February 27th, 1976. And it reads in part, Argentina, the armed forces are apparently preparing to oust President Maria Estela Perón soon, perhaps as early as this weekend. So it was almost another month before the coup took place. And these PDBs are based on a lot of intelligence reporting, a lot of which was also released in the ADP. So you can see the sources for this PDB as well as the PDB itself, which the president saw. <clears throat> the next one, um, is another document that made it pretty high level in the government. Um, this is the beginning of a 14 page memo, which details the testimony of Alfredo Bravo to US embassy officers in Buenos Aires. So this is by far one of the most sobering documents I found during my research. Um, Alfredo Bravo was an Argentine union leader and he was the co-founder of the Argentine Permanent Assembly for Human Rights. 
Now, in 1978, he told U.S. embassy officers about the torture he suffered during his detention by people that he thought were the Buenos, the Buenos Aires Provincial Police in 1977. This 14-page memo was sent to the White House by people in the Department of State, and several officials in the White House read it and commented in handwriting on how important it was for their understanding of what was happening in Argentina. The version that was sent to the White House, the memo that sort of circulated inside the White House is also published in my first volume, but this 14 page memo is not. Um, most of the records released during the ADP tended to be written by lower level officials than the documents we published in fruit in Fruis. So they're more raw, they're not summarized, they're not filtered through analysis of the US government. They're, they're very few of them reach the president's desk. They're sort of the information flow from the bottom going up to the top. You get the whole bottom slew of information that the US government collects. <clears throat> so I think it's interesting to consider what kinds of information those documents contain and how they support those goals of accountability and transparency, and also how Argentines might use them and are using them. Um, one of the most extraordinary is the, uh, the next slide is um, this Central Intelligence Agency. It's called an Intelligence Information Cable. So that's a type of document that's always headed with very tiny type that you might be able to see here that says, this is an information report, not finally evaluated intelligence. So you see a lot of these in the archive and they always have that caveat at the top. In other words, they're raw and unverified. That doesn't mean that the, the information is untrue. It means that it had not been confirmed at the time that this uh, report was written. So there's many types of records like this in the ADP. They're from the CIA, but also the Defense Intelligence Agency. The FBI has a lot of these that were released in the ADP as well. Um, this one, which is dated September 8th, 1977, contains really raw and painful to read reporting about the kidnapping and assassination of, Argentine, of Argentina's sitting ambassador to Venezuela at the time, whose name was Hector Hidalgo Sola. So while he was in Caracas as, Argentine, as Argentina's ambassador, uh, Hidalgo Sola met with Argentine refugees, which was a per pretty daring position to take if you were inside the Argentine government at the time. And he was also, researchers found out later, was trying to internally push the military regime away from its policy of repression and human rights abuses and disappearances. So when he was on a visit to Buenos Aires in July 1977, he was kidnapped. Uh, and this CIA intelligence information cable, which is two months later, reports that Hidalgo Sola was murdered, quote, by a special group which has worked for the state intelligence secretariat, which is called CIDE which was Argentina's intelligence agency at the time. Um, on, the next page, on the next slide, the same cable you can see contains the address of a house, um, which I really poorly highlighted. It's Bacacay 3570 here. Uh, and that's where Hidalgo Sola was taken after he was kidnapped. So that address had never been publicly known before. Um, and after this, so this document was released in April of 2019. And over a year later, a court in Argentina announced that this document had helped to establish that the house at that address was a clandestine detention center. So it was one that survivors had described before in testimony. And I'm just going to drop this in the chat too. Um, but the location of the house had never been known because the survivors had been blindfolded when they went in and out of the house. Um, so this was the same house where um, a U.S. citizen named Mercedes Navarra Bender was also taken after she was kidnapped in May of 1976. Um, and she was tortured there as well before she was released through the efforts of U.S. diplomats um, shortly after that. So what that tells historians and researchers in Argentina is that this appears to be one of the earliest detention sites that was used by CIDE after the March 1976 coup. Um, so that's just one example of, I think, a fascinating phenomenon that no one involved in this product could have done by themselves. Um, researchers, legal investigators, NGOs, historians in Argentina continue to comb through these US government documents years later to search for these kinds of details. 
And that, that kind of detail, the address, is not the kind of thing that's routinely declassified and published in FRUS, but it is the sort of detail that was prioritized in the ADP and that, that people fought really hard to not have redacted. Um, there were waivers to some kind of other kinds of privacy and uh, other things that the president decided were less important to protect things like that address than it is to get it out so people can use it for human rights and conflict transformation purposes. Um, and I think what's exciting is that we can only assume that researchers are going to find more tiny details like that, that will help them piece together the full history of the military dictatorship in a way that would not have been possible without the release of these documents. Human rights trials in Argentina are ongoing, and those details play a vital role. So the thing that was most exciting for me when I worked on this um, is that I think US government transparency, which we all work for and think about every day, can directly support people who are fighting for historical accountability and that kind of conflict transformation that your group focuses on that I think is so admirable. So that's all I have prepared. I really would love to hear questions. <laughs> um, Feel free to email us also, His, Kathy helpfully put um, that history at state.gov um, there on the slide, and we would love to hear from you. Any questions or thoughts you have, I'd be happy to answer, and I know Kathy would too. I'll hop on really quick just to say thank you so much for that uh, wonderful and thorough presentation. And I have quite a long list of questions, but <laughs> definitely like to open it up to the audience um, first. So I'm not like dominating the conversation or anything. Um, would love to hear from you all. You guys have any questions? Looks like we have actually something in the in in the question and answer tab. Oh thank you. So Mahara Akrami asks, your work is fascinating. Thank you. Um, I have several questions, but the one I really want to ask is about how your office balances narrative pressure and the historical reality in the framing of the official records your office produces specifically relevant to US actions historically. With different folks in power at different times pulling in different directions, does your office face pressure to present a differently formed narrative? And if so, how do you manage that pressure? That's an excellent question. And mm -hmm. um, it's it's an issue that, that all all sort of official, you know, sort of government historians have to, with which they have to contend, right? Because you don't want to be known as a court historian. Um, I, we, the, the, the good news is, is that, I mean, we do have a congressional mandate, which means that it does set certain standards that we have to meet in the foreign relations series. Um, and happily, generally speaking, we don't, you know, administrations come and go, and we actually don't find, at least in the modern period, that there's been pressure on us to document a certain, um, you know, a certain episode one way or another. What does happen, though, is um, sort of current policy definitely can affect the declassification of first volumes. Um, there may be current political sensitivities associated with something we're trying to publish and it can hold up our volumes from being published for an extended period of time. Um, you know, we've, we've got a lot of volumes in publication right now. You can see on our website, um, if you look at the status of the series, more there are just a ton of volumes that are currently <laughs> stuck in D-class. Um, some of them, you know, for, for various reasons. But sometimes this is, this is where sort of like, sort of the current policy and past policy there is some tension there, but it comes out and not in how we put together the volumes, uh, not in how we frame, you know, frame, frame the frame the issues that we that we document, but more about just trying to get them out. What do you, Sarah, would you, what do you think? Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Yeah, I will say that I asked this exact question in my interview for this job. <laughs> and uh, what I was told, which I think is borne out, is that um, the government cannot uh, redact something from a document published in Fruce because it's embarrassing. That's not a reason that anything gets redacted. Um, and 
Uh, I think that's true. Like I, I've, there's lots of embarrassing stuff that's been published in Fruce, uh, or potentially embarrassing. You should, you should say, uh, you know, there's, uh, well, we'll not get into examples, but <laughs> there's lots of stuff that could be considered embarrassing. And I think one thing that has also been rewarding as I've worked on the sort of internal side of things has been that, you know, people will ask a question because they genuinely need to know the answer. They don't want it sugarcoated because if it if you sugarcoat it or try to present it in a way that you think they want it answered, it doesn't help them. Um, so one thing that I always try to do when answering those internal questions as opposed to publishing first volume is, is figure out both what the person says they need to know, but also what I think they need to know. <laughs> so, and um, in most cases, that's that's welcome. They they are happy to learn more things than they had a question about. Um, so that that's always uh, a rewarding thing because I think all of us in the office don't believe in you know the, the state telling you what to think, <laughs> um, and that's something that we will continue to oppose. <laughs> uh, and luckily, we have sort of the law and practice to, to back us up on that most of the time. But that's a really great question. Thank you. I see a raised hand. Oh, there we go. I'm allowed to talk. Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is um, Eliza. And I was wondering, um, are other efforts to translate public documents similar to the Argentine NGOs? Um, is your office prioritizing this? Do you want to take that, Kathy? <laughs> I assume you're asking about the first volumes. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, specifically Fruce. Um, I, it's funny because I actually was thinking more about sort of other sort of uh, specific sort of bilat, um, bilateral document releases um, with respect to other countries. But in terms of Fruce, both. Both. Oh, okay, great. In terms of Fruce, <laughs> um, frankly, uh, we are, we don't, we don't necessarily prioritize any particular volumes in terms of getting it out. Um, we, you know, at the beginning of the reason again why you didn't see any w like george w bush volumes listed on there is because we haven't planned the series just yet um and we do the planning for the series takes place within our office um among sort of the subject matter experts who you know read into all the memoir literature go to the archives start getting a sense of sort of where it looks like sort of the, the administration's policy priorities lay um and um start thinking about how many like sort of what should be sort of like what what issues should receive perhaps more um coverage than they would in previous you know previously so for example obviously when we get to w um clearly terrorism uh, counterterrorism is going to be is going to be big um the war on terror is going to be big the you know iraq is going to get a lot of volumes um i would i would hope that there's like a big huge document collection on the the millennium you know the millennium mission initiative in terms of of um or in pepfar um so so we so we decide we sort of we sort of let the documents guide us um because ultimately we're we we have to you know our, our mandate says we have to talk about sort of significant diplomatic activity i don't know if that answers the question we also do as sarah suggests though we also do include um you know we we there are there are also volumes that we that we always have like there's always there's always volumes documenting bilateral relations with um not every country, um, but you know, but obviously with every region, um, and we sort of focus on the high level issues within each region. Um, we always have a volume on national security policy, at least one. We always have a volume on foreign economic policy, thank God, because um, otherwise my experience would be would not be very useful. Um, uh, you know, and then again, depends upon the priorities. And so that's why there's, you know, a lot of focus on human rights for Carter, which gets shrunk down really small for Reagan. <laughs> So, but I'll leave it over to Sarah in terms of more sort of bilateral um, uh, other uh, document release. 
Yeah, there was during the ADP, there was talk about sort of how to publish them a website, you know, tradi not traditionally, but in previous releases like this, they would like hand a CD of documents to the other embassy. Uh, but nobody wanted to do that this time because the internet exists now. <laughs> uh, so uh, there was talk about like how to do it, but um, NGO has asked about, uh, for instance, like, will there be a, uh, like a Excel spreadsheet or something listing every document and where we can find it and what it's about and the to and from and, you know, to help people navigate those 48,000 documents. And that's not, we couldn't do that. And frankly, doing that would have delayed the release of the documents even longer. And that was nobody's goal was to keep this project inside the government for longer. So um, there's always a cost benefit analysis, I think, between, uh, you know, people inside the government doing more analysis and uh, translating and, you know, all the sorts of other things that we could do, we could do, uh, given enough funding and people versus just getting the documents out uh, and letting researchers elsewhere do that work. So one of the things that I think is cool about that Argentine NGO coalition is that they are doing that work. They are translating the subjects of documents into Spanish and putting it up on their website. They are making it understood where, you know, where the documents came from. They translated some summaries, I think, of some particularly interesting or important documents. But that, like, I don't think that's work that the U.S. government should be doing. That's more interpretive and um, sort of archival in a way than, than a D-class initiative. Um, and frankly, I, I didn't want it kept inside the government any longer. <laughs> you want to push these out. That's the whole point. So um, there's a couple of other questions on the Q&A. Um, I'm happy to read them, Kathy. So um, Eliza asked, are there meetings of the minds or historical conferences for you and your global counterparts to hammer out historical truths, confirm accuracy and root out misinformation? You could talk about ISED maybe, you know more about that than I do. Um, and then there's another one and we're running right up on three o'clock, but I think we have time to tackle both of these. Another one asks an anonymous, person asks, is there any work being done within your office or in collaboration with other offices on data visualization to complement these historical records? Another question I know is we're talking about, but I don't know much about it. <laughs> so Kathy, to you. <laughs> <laughs> Eliza, another great question. Thank you. Um, a, a lot of our historians, um, you know, continue to be active within sort of the larger historical community. And so, you know, read the, liter the latest literature, um, go to conferences, present their own work, sometimes based on, you know, the stuff they've done here that's been declassified, um, other times based upon their own private scholarship. Um, so they stay engaged and active in their fields of expertise. Um, we also do, as Sarah suggested, we also do actually meet um, every two years with um, sort of our counterpart uh, programs around the world, other other offices, historical offices around the world, um, uh, who also produce sort of documentary histories like the Foreign Relations series, get together and talk about sort of best practices and how to sort of make them more accessible and and complain about declassification holding us up. Um, so we we do have a, we do have a meeting of the minds Conf in, in terms of like confirming accuracy and rooting out misinformation. I think this is. Um, we we the other the other the other sort of body we have that helps us with um, with that is we actually have a federal advisory committee um, that is uh, comprised of sort of scholars representing different disciplines historic history political science international law um, who advises us um, on uh, sort of big historical issues but also when called upon as they have sometimes in the past to actually look at very specific first volumes or even specific documents that we've chosen for Fruce to um, give sort of give their opinion to say you know what this is this is maybe not so thorough or accurate and reliable or yeah you know you can't get some documents out but like really this, this is a great collection and, and really it should be it should get out sooner rather than later um, 
uh, data visualization, we actually have a historian on staff whose specialty is, is data visualization. Um, and uh, my understanding, so uh, clearly I'm not the tech, I'm not a tech person, but uh, I do know that the data from our website is sort of configured in a variety of ways where it can be manipulated. And we've had like, we've, we've actually had presentations by folks who've done really sort of really cool stuff with our data and, and found sort of discerned interesting trends um, across time. And in terms of visualization, again, we have a historian in our staff who's actually really into that. I know he's working specifically, and I'm not sure if there's anything on our website. I can't think of anything right now, Sarah, that reflects his work, but um, but it's definitely being it's definitely being thought of in terms of you know sort of like visualizing sort of like I know I've seen some charts. It's like you know sort of like heat maps, basically, sort of like who who does the U.S. sort of like have the sort of like most relations with, as it were. Um, so it's, it's, it's really cool. It's really cool. Yeah. Stuff, I agree. And I know that other scholars draw on that data mm -hmm. that is publicly available on our website to do things like that. So the, the one I'm thinking of is a Washington Post blog that publishes a lot of sort of historical stuff. And they used the travels databases, the travels of the president and secretary of state to sort of visualize mm -hmm how important travel has been or not been in particular administrations and to where and why. Um, so that those are cool ways that um, that data can be used, not necessarily by us, <laughs> but it's there for everyone to use. We have another question in the chat. I, I have a minute. Do you have a minute, Sarah? Sure. My questions, in case you have time, are there any FRUS equivalents abroad that, that your respective teams refer to to learn about history and any historical gaps? Great question. Um, Sarah, what was the most interesting question a politician diplomat asked you? Mm -hmm. um, both, <laughs> what is your favorite part about this work and ultimately why is it important? Seems like you contribute a lot to many of the different corners of the State Department. History is critical in knowing where you will go in the future or perhaps where you shouldn't go. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> there are as there are first equivalents. Um, uh, the, the 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 Canadians the Canadians have a series. The Brits have a series. The French have a series. The Germans, the Israelis. Um, uh, it tends to be. I think it does tend to be sort of um, sort of Western Europe. Uh, to include Canada, um, uh, sort of specific, uh, or rather, sort of concentrated, rather. Um, but we do one thing that we do, though, is like folks, um, you know, like like his, like historians or government officials in other countries who are interested in starting up programs. Um, we've actually, you know, talked to a lot of them and sort of talked about what it means to have this kind of program, and you know how it's it's you know it's great for historians and 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 scholars and blah blah blah. But it's also really great for democracy, um, you know, to have a program that's devoted to getting documents out. Um, and getting the most important documents out and getting them out quickly. So, and Sarah, what's your most interesting question? That's a that's a really hard one. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, one of the one of the most interesting things that I was asked for the Argentina project was which here's a slew of documents that we're going to release next week or next month. Which are the most interesting? Like, which are going to get attention in the newspapers <laughs> that's a really hard question to ask but also really fun uh, i mean fun in the context of human rights in argentina like it's really interesting to try to give advice about you know what ha what has been known in the public about these topics what will these documents add to that discussion what might a media organization be interested in versus what we in the government are interested in versus what a historian is interested in that that was like a really meaty question. Um, the other the other things that spring to mind, frankly, are that I'm I was trained as a 19th century historian. So any question I get that it's about the 19th century thrills me. <laughs> uh, so I've been asked. Um, Frederick Douglass was a U.S. diplomat uh, a couple of times. He was an ambassador to Haiti. Like, what did he do? Uh, super fun for me to look into that and research it and. Um, tell people about it. Um, uh, my other favorite one was uh, we are celebrating our ex uh, anniversary of relations with the government. Uh, but we think that started on this date and 
the government, the other, the host government thinks it started on this date. Like, why are the dates different? And I looked into this and it turns out there was like a huge scandal between the two dates that everyone had forgot about because it's the 19th century. So I got to write this whole paper about why the two dates were different and it was super fun and interesting. So anything like that where there's sort of a weird mystery and no one knows why it is, but a historian can figure it out, like that's really fun. <laughs> so um, thank you, that's a great question. Thank you for <laughs> letting me talk about it. <laughs> In terms of the, why is, why is our work important? Um, I think probably Sarah would agree. I think that just, again, accountability. I mean, you know, when I, I got this job back in 2002, I, you know, I started work here and I thought, oh, this is great. This is, you know, this is, this is great work for a historian. I get to live in DC. You know, this is, this is fabulous. But I, I didn't realize at the time that, that what I would really come to value most about it is that, again, is that, you know, we're a 40 odd professionally trained kind of persnickety snarky historians who you know feel really strongly about making sure that we hold you know that that we do our job and like this responsibility that we have that comes with like the special access we have frankly to anything we want to see in terms of documentation to to have the government hold itself accountable for what it does around the world in you know the names of its citizens and um I, that's 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 really the thing that actually that that makes me proudest about this job. I think it's, I think it's a really great thing. We don't always get everything we want to get, mm -hmm. but we get, we get, you know, we feel, we feel good about, about sort of getting out what we, what we get out. So Sarah, and that particularly applies to your work on the ADP, which is just remarkable. Yeah. I've learned that about, this is something I've learned about myself is that I enjoy my work a lot more when I'm genuinely interested in it. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not interested in every question that I get. I don't think anyone is ever interested in their job every day, but uh, at least I never have been, <laughs> but you know, in this, in this job in particular, there's usually something that I can sort of grab onto that I find genuinely interesting and I can dive into it. And um, I'm sort of given the freedom to, to go down those rabbit holes and to figure things out for myself. And that's, that's, uh, that's really rewarding. Thanks for those great questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amazing. I'll hop back on camera really quickly. I just wanna say thank you so much again for such a fascinating uh, presentation. And, you know, it's, it's really cool to see, you know, a kind of behind the, si uh, behind the scenes, excuse me, a team that really arms, you know, our decision makers and the mm. public with pertinent information. Again, I think a lot of people, um, and this may be a generalization, but I'm making it anyway. <laughs> I think a lot of people <laughs> like to jump in and come up with solutions and be, you know, kind of like the frontline heroes and, and do all these cool things, but they're not armed with the historical context and the information mm. they need to make really informed and impactful decisions. And you two are at the front lines of doing that work and making sure, well, seriously, external <laughs> um, with the State Department. So it's it's really cool to learn about that. And I can't wait to shop around this uh, webinar with the rest of our membership and and really get folks uh, engaged in, I think a really, a, a little known or a lesser known um, yeah. but really important arm of the State Department. So. Um, again, it was a pleasure to have you both. Um, Thank you. Again. Agreed. Thanks Thank you so much. for staying over time a little bit. <laughs> uh, we really appreciate it. And thanks to the audience for, for great questions. Definitely. Um, and we look forward to the next time because as mentioned, this is a series. <laughs> series. Is number one. <laughs> uh, we got number one under our belt and the next one's going to be even better. So thanks cool. again. And thanks everyone for joining.